at least I think that's how the film opens. I am Brandon Scott Jensen. I am a year old, Gnostic, bisexual, polyamorous, bear cub, working on becoming a muscle cub, comic book artist and script supervisor, and I am obstreperous as fuck. This is me ranting about one, or more, of my more than 3,000 DVDs and Blu-rays. My thoughts, a look at some of the extra stuff you may have skipped, and sometimes exclusive behind the scenes stuff because I work in film, I know people, and I want a reason for the show. So stay tuned. As these are movies that I own, it may be mostly a big love fest. Mostly. I'd love to hear your thoughts about which of these thousands of films I should rant about. But if I don't own it, it's probably not happening. That said, let's do this. Twelve Monkeys is a 1995 film directed by Terry Gilliam of Monty Python fame. Do we still have to say fame? I mean, does anyone under the age of 40 know who they are? And starring Bruce Willis, Madeline Stowe, and Brad Pitt about time travel, the end of the world, and a man who can't determine which reality he's experiencing is real. And for the last four months, well, the last four years, really, I can relate. So let's talk about this older film. We start on a scene of a shooting in an airport. A little boy watches the man be shot and a woman runs to his side. Off the boy's face, we are several years in the future where human beings live underground after a deadly virus has killed off five billion people, the vast majority of the human race. James Cole is in prison for multiple violations of the permanent emergency code. He volunteers to go to the surface to collect specimens, and since he has a strong mind, he is selected by a group of scientists for their latest experiment, time travel. The scientists want to go back in time and stop the doomsday that began in 1996. So he's sent back to that time. Or so he thinks. He is in fact sent back to 1990, where he is almost immediately put in an insane asylum by Dr. Catherine Rayleigh. In the asylum, where we are treated to multiple stereotypes of the mentally ill. Oh, 1995, of all the things we miss about you. He is introduced to Jeffrey Goines. If you don't buy things, toilet paper. Hmm. Cue conspiracy theorists. And realizes where he is. This is a place for crazy people. Yep. He tries, in vain, to explain that he's from the future but he sounds just as disturbed as the other inmates. Befriending Jeffrey, he tells him, Maybe the human race deserves to be wiped out. While watching actual real life animal rights videos of animal abuse. Did I mention in the opening that I'm also a vegetarian? And then a probably not real commercial for the Florida Keys. Soon after, he disappears from 1990 and the scientists are surprised to learn that he met Jeffrey. They try again to send him back to 1996, but first he has to make a pit stop in 1919, where he is butt naked in the middle of a war. Bruce Willis spends a lot of this movie barely dressed or nude. They do the whole clothes can't travel through time trope. He was going through this naked phase in movies back then, and you know what? That's fine by me. He was a sexy 39 year old. But then, after seeing his friend, Jose, another volunteer, he is finally in 1996. Dr. Rayleigh is now an accomplished author of a book on doomsday scenarios. An evil redhead tries to warn her, but he is thwarted by an eager extra. Dr. Rayleigh, hi. I wonder if you're aware of my own studies. I'm sure his lines were scripted, but he just feels like an extra to me. Soon, James carjacks her, and they're off to Philadelphia. Dramatic hijinks ensue, including a great silly scene that is, <laughs> it's very Terry Gilliam with the scientists. Anyway, Catherine finally starts to lose her faith in psychology. Not sure that's a good thing. And when she sees a picture of James in World War I, believes that he's likely telling the truth about a plague that will wipe out humanity, which she and James now believe Jeffrey is behind although the evil redhead seems to also be involved. 
Meanwhile, James seems to now believe that 1996 is the present, and that the scientists at all are part of his delusions. It starts to get fuzzy as to which reality is really even real within the narrative, but the one constant is the flashbacks, or flash-forwards, the ones with the little boy seeing the man shot and the blonde falling over him. But Madeline Stowe has some absolutely fantastic lines. <laughs> you had a bullet from World War I in your leg, James. How did it get there? I don't know. Uh, put him in the closet. Well, but take his money first. You want me to rob him? We need cash, James. They don disguises, and James removes the tracking device the scientists put in his teeth. Uh, they try to escape to Florida, while Jeffrey and the Army of the Twelve Monkeys release a bunch of zoo animals while a doomsday terrorist, the evil redhead, heads out to cause the literal end of the world. The scientists are warned, and there's a really cool ambiguous ending where we may learn what the scientists were really up to the whole time. And of course, we watch the scene from the beginning with the shooting play out for our mains. And yeah, believe it or not, this wasn't as obviously unrealistic before 9-11. The end. This film was based on a really neat little short film called La Jetée from 1962, which was almost exclusively a series of still black and white photos with a narration. But it really laid the groundwork for this film. The screenwriters were very careful to be respectful to the original film while writing the screenplay, and the director was respectful to them as writers. As I mentioned, the director was Terry Gilliam, but if you're Generation Z or whatever we're calling the Youngs this week, you've never heard of Terry Gilliam, Monty Python, or probably this movie at all. Maybe you've heard of the sci-fi series from a few years ago. I was really into it for the first season and a half, then lost interest. Though I did work briefly with the lead in that series. Nice guy. Either way, the late 90s had a few end-of-the-world themed films. We were headed towards Y2K, which everyone was absolutely beyond certain would definitely be the end of the world. Because of a perceived glitch in computers' internal clocks, everything from computers that run banks and power grids to home computers and... I shit you not, I heard this on the damn news. Some toasters were supposed to just suddenly stop working. Now, this film completely eschews any of the Y2K stuff, which is probably why it holds up. And the end of the world is presented here as something that has already happened, and the scientists are trying to go back and stop. But for those in the present of 1995 or 96, they're still completely ignoring any possibility of the end of the world. In fact, there's a scene where everybody laughs at it. Years later, there was the Mayan prophecy that the world was absolutely beyond certain, definitely going to end in 2012. And we got the completely accurate representation of what would happen in 2012 in the movie 2012, made in 2009. End of the world scenarios, I guess, fascinate me sometimes. Recently, a lot of people were binging the movie Contagion on streaming services, which I mean, sure, okay, to be honest, I've never seen it, but this little movie from, believe it or not, a plucky group of filmmakers which by 1996 standards did not have a huge budget, or even by today's standards for that matter, but it did have a group of dedicated artists, and that does inspire me. And recent world events made me want to watch it again. As I said, part of what intrigues me about this film is the ambiguity of what's real and what isn't. You certainly can take the film at face value. James Cole lives in the future and travels back in time to try and save the world and happens to fall in love along the way. But you can also take the position that James is a paranoid schizophrenic, an unreliable narrator as the lead character. The scientists and asylum doctors mirror each other quite well. Jeffrey and Riley make great shoulder devil and angels respectively. So there's no right or wrong way to view the film. Gilliam himself has stated that the ambiguity was intentional. Director of photography, Roger Pratt, and likely the director as well, as they are longtime collaborators. His use of lenses and angles, especially in the asylum scenes, are particularly inspired for all of this. Dutch angles and spheric lenses, 
God, I hope that's right. As a scripty, I really should know this. Imply the possibility that the time travel, or indeed the present itself, are figments of James's imagination. This is kept to a minimum in later scenes, except for those in the future, probably for the best, as it would have made the film quite dizzy. As an end-of-the-world narrative, the film is rather pessimistic. Apparently, it's inevitable. And although James himself may be doomed, I prefer to look at his journey as optimistic, reflective of humanity on the whole. The scientists have sent others back in time. While those folks tend to just do the whole sex, drugs, and rock and roll thing, while James, and some others, certainly, mostly sticks to his mission, even after he's abandoned it, he still makes a call that unfortunately may doom him. But remember that the future may not be a reality. Regardless of that, he is able to find joy in life, romance even. And there is something to be said about finding happiness in the little things in life, especially with the world we live in now. He loves the music of the 20th century. He loves the air. And it is my fervent hope that the situation we find ourselves in in early to mid-2020, since I'm dropping this video in mid-2020, I can't say beyond that, will pass soon. Or by the time you see this, has passed. I believe that the message of optimism is something that we can all use. And speaking of optimism, I have my very first Patreon subscriber, Craig A. Butler. Craig is a filmmaker too, having directed a Western released by Lionsgate a few years ago, along with other films. He is an amazing human being and I am so grateful to him. You can become a Patreon as well and get a shout out in my videos, along with your name in the credits. Just click the link below for Patreon. Uh, there are levels that start with only $1 a month and some neat stuff depending on your tier. Also, if you don't want to spend money and you're not subscribed to my channel, if you could click subscribe, as well as the notification bell so YouTube knows how awesome you think my show is. I'd also love a comment below. I am really good about responding to comments. And if you could also share my videos. I have other videos that in the works that are a bit more informative with uh, more in-depth behind the scenes stuff. So if you like that better, be on the lookout for that. That's all I have for today, but please stay safe out there, friends, and thank you for watching.